questions. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for the 2020-2022 State Health Improvement Plan Chronic Disease Work Team Meeting. This is Era Gina Clay, Health Policy Analyst at the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. Before we get started today, just a few housekeeping items. For now, everyone is in listen-only mode. We definitely want this to be an interactive meeting, so if you have any questions, make sure to type those into the question box. If you would like to talk during today's discussion, raise your hand and we will unmute you. If you have muted yourself, you'll need to unmute yourself in order for everyone else to hear your comments. Once again, make sure that you've entered your audio pin. You need to log into the webinar first before calling in order to get your pin. To access today's meeting slides and other materials, including um, the recording of the webinar, uh, visit HPIO's Shaw Ship webpage. So here's a list of all of the stakeholders involved in the ship. Uh, as you can see, that the chronic disease work team is located at the foundation to the left, and it's outlined in red, so you're able to identify yourself. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my colleagues at HPIO joining us today. In the room, we have Amy Bush Stevens, Alana Clark Kirk, and Haley Aka. You should also uh, see a list of today's webinar participants on your screen. So, in a moment, Amy will provide more background information on the ship process and purpose and list out and a list of outcomes and indicators for chronic disease. Then we will move into some discussion on setting overall targets, identifying priority populations, and setting priority population targets. Today's meeting will conclude with the next steps for the project. Our objective is for HPIO and ODH to have the guidance needed to finalize the overall targets, priority populations, and priority population targets for chronic disease. As a reminder, no final uh, decisions uh, will be made as a result of the call today, but your input will guide the final decisions that are to be made over the next few weeks. So now I'm going to hand it over to Amy for review of the ship process and purpose. Good afternoon, everyone. I see we have over 20 people on the call today, so that's fantastic. We may have um, a few more folks joining us as we go along. This is actually the third work team webinar that we've done today, and I see a few folks who have been with us on um, one or two of the webinars that we had this morning. And um, the, ma the material that I'm going to cover in this first part of the webinar is a repeat across all six of these work team webinars. So if you are um, going to be participating in more than one, um, feel free to uh, tune out <laughs> some of what I say um, that might be repetitive. Uh, but we are excited to have the chronic disease group uh, meeting right now. And I'm going to start with some background on the State Health Improvement Plan purpose and process. This is our timeline. Our goal is to uh, finalize the ship by the end of September. And so you can see we are here in July, um, kind of towards the middle of the process during the target setting phase. That's what we're going to be talking about today. As we move into uh, the end of July and early August, we're going to be moving into the strategy selection phase of the work. And this entire process is happening um, in conjunction with the maternal and child health and maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting or MCV assessment um, that we are also working on facilitating with the Department of Health. The purpose of the ship is to get us all rowing in the same direction to improve population health in Ohio. And that's why it's important for us to be concise and prioritize toward common goals. We know that prioritizing is difficult work, but it is necessary if we're gonna get strategic about working together to improve outcomes. 
The ship will be a tool to align state agencies, and we have a steering committee for this work that is made up of directors or their designees from these agencies. Um, so it's been really great to have input um, from some of these agencies that are from sectors beyond health. The ship is also a tool to encourage uh, stronger alignment between what's happening at the local level and the state level and collaboration between all of these different partners. The ship is our opportunity to track progress over time. This chart takes an early look at progress on objectives in the 2017-2019 ship and um, on this Chart green indicates things are improving, yellow means little or no detectable change, and red means things are getting worse. So we clearly know we have lots of work to do. The goal of the ship is to get Ohio into the green. So that's really the vision of where we're headed is getting to a place of improvement and progress. That's what it's all about. And the goal is to ensure that all Ohioans have the opportunity to achieve their full health potential. And this means eliminating disparities and inequities and achieving equity. Now we'll take a look at the SHIP framework. This is the most recent version of the framework. If you were familiar with the previous ship, you'll see that we've made some changes to how this is set up. The first thing we did was we flipped the ship. So putting that emphasis on the health factors that are listed along the left, particularly those community conditions or social determinants of health. We also simplified some of the language with those questions across the top and elevated equity. Here's where chronic disease fits in with this overall picture. And that's where we're gonna be focusing today, but it's important to keep in mind how all of these different areas are connected and really thinking about how those health factors shape the outcomes that we're gonna be talking about in chronic disease. These are the main components of the ship. We have our SMART objectives and priority populations. Those are groups with um, the worst health outcomes, and then our evidence-based strategies and strategies to reduce disparities, inequities, racism, and discrimination. And today we're focused here on the SMART objectives and the priority populations. And as a reminder, here's our objective for the call today. So we're not making any final decisions about what the targets will be, but we are getting your feedback so that we can move forward with making those decisions over the next month or so. Now looking more closely at chronic disease, reminder of where we've been and how, how we came to the outcomes and indicators that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, this whole process of prioritizing started back in October 2018 with regional forums where we gathered uh, local stakeholder input then we also looked at secondary data in the state health assessment, and the Department of Health is going to be releasing that assessment soon. Then we shared the information um, from those sources with the steering committee and the advisory committee, and including the June 4th advisory committee meeting, where we had a small group discussion that was focused on chronic disease. And hopefully we have some folks on the call today who, who were part of that small group conversation. Then we followed up that meeting with an online prioritization survey in early June. And we've taken all of this feedback um, through all of these sources to get us down to a concise set of outcomes and indicators for chronic disease that we'll look at in just a minute here. First, we want to get a sense of how many of you um, have been um, engaged in the, the process so far. So. Um, the June 4th meeting is where we had that small group discussion about chronic disease, where we looked at prioritizing outcomes and indicators. So take a minute to fill out this poll. Let us know if you participated in that conversation, um, if you participated in that meeting but attended a different small group, or maybe you weren't able to come but you did review the materials, or no. 
And what we're talking about today really builds upon this whole series of work. And so if you're just getting involved in the work team now, welcome to the group. Um, and please make sure you go back and look at this stuff on the website so you um, have that base of information. Okay, so a third of you did participate in that small group discussion. That's great. And many of you also reviewed the materials and some new, new folks to the group. So we welcome the new folks. These are the desired outcomes um, that we have identified for chronic disease as a result of those conversations and that prioritization survey. These were the criteria that we used to get us there. And then this is looking at more detail um, and shows the specific indicators for each of these and the data sources. So you'll notice there are some changes um, from, um, slight changes from how chronic disease looked in the previous ship. You'll notice the addition of child lead poisoning. And Haley is gonna take us into more detail on those indicators in a minute. Um, but first I'd like to provide some background information on targets and priority populations. I'm sure many of you are familiar with SMART objectives and have, have experience in crafting those for your organizations. Um, here's an example. This is from the previous ship. These were the um, SMART objectives. And we're gonna be focusing today on targets. So that's the right-hand columns. And then these were the priority populations from the last ship, and we're gonna be talking about how to update those today. And this is an example of what it looks like when we report out on those SMART objectives. This is from the early progress report. Just a snapshot of part of that chronic disease progress report. So what we're doing today is talking about how to update these targets for chronic disease, how to update the priority populations for chronic disease so that in the future, we can be tracking these things over time to report out like this. Looking at the components of a SMART objective, specific and measurable refers to the indicator and the source. So we've done that work and um, that was that list that I showed you and that Haley's going to get into in more detail in a minute. Achievable and realistic refers to the target data value and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And time bound refers to specific years for the baseline and target and we have set 2022 as the target year for all objectives in the ship and the baselines vary depending on the data source. We think it's worth spending a bit more time talking about these two words here, achievable and realistic. We think it's also important to be aspirational. So there's sort of a tension here between achievable and realistic versus aspirational. As we set targets, it could look like this where we focus more on being aspirational. So that means really shooting for the stars and setting our goals or we could take a more incremental approach that may be more realistic. Or we could strike a balance where we would look at what seems achievable given our current trends, but then really reach a bit and push ourselves for a better outcome than the status quo. And we, this is where we would love to get some conversations started and get your input on um, what you think, which approach you think we should take when we set the targets. So should the emphasis be on being achievable and realistic or being aspirational um, or a balance between the two and why? So um, please raise your hand. You should see the little hand button where you can raise your hand. 
um, and we will unmute you so that you can talk to the group. Again, you'll need to have put in your audio pin, and if you've muted yourself, you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, alternatively, you can use the question box to type in your comments, but we encourage you to raise your hand because um, it's more interesting to hear a variety of voices on the call rather than just my voice. So again, the question is, um, when setting ship targets, do you think the emphasis should be on achievable and realistic targets, so taking that more incremental approach, or have um, really aspirational targets, or a balance, and why? Definitely pros and cons to all of these approaches. I see a comment in the question box from Amy. Achievable target with aspirations of exceeding it. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have a hand raised. Candy, go ahead. Candy, we Can you can't hear, hear you yet. Yeah, there I am. I there you go. kind of crossed over. I just wanted to say, since we're, we're dealing with human behaviors here, I think we, we need to be um, more uh, what reasonable. I've always loved being um, aspirational, but these goals require so much of the patient um, participation that I think that, that makes it, um, lends itself to making our goals be more achievable and realistic. No. All right, we're switching over headsets. And hopefully this will work. It looks like we lost sound for a minute there. But now we're back. All right, and we have some hands raised. Um, Andy, go ahead. Candy. Candy, go ahead. Did you hear me at all? I thought I broke it. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. I I was just saying that I think because we're dealing with um, human behaviors and so much of um, of our goal setting is going to be based on um, our our community and, and their behaviors and making change. So I think we really need to make our goals more achievable. I um, always love being aspirational, but I think that um, we don't want to set our goals so high that it's going to feel like we didn't get anywhere and we, we need to make them more reasonable and achievable for these. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to read off some of these comments in the question box um, from Amy Headings. Given past history, I don't know that many of the issues we are working on will change dr drastically over time. Since the ship is such a short time frame before we start working on the next ship, the goals should be... That's just cut off for me, I, I think achievable. Um, and I, I think that's a great thing for us to think about is the time horizon here. We are on a three year cycle. And so thinking about that continuity over time um, will be important for us to, to think about. Um, from Anne, we have achievable and realistic targets until we get into the green with our indicators. Then we can be aspirational. 
Okay, and Anne says, hate to set overly aspirational goals that people give up before we get started. And we have a hand raised from Kathy. Kathy, go ahead. Hi, um, I would like to second what everyone is saying, that we really should stick with achievable when you're talking about chronic conditions. Um, but part of my thinking too, is how we're setting what that goal is going to be, what that benchmark is going to be. Um, because in the chronic condition, well, I, I noticed in the childhood one, we're actually uh, looking at hospitalizations, which I would strongly encourage the state to do. Use actual data that's out there. On the um, hypertension and diabetes, we're looking at BRFSS data, which is self-reported. But these are both conditions that thousands of providers around the state are very used to producing actual data that goes to CDC and CMS on this that is not limited just to Medicare patients. It is all their patients. And I would um, encourage us to look at a more objective standard that will actually show improvement because um, it, it's been <clears throat> my impression because of all the various programs that the providers in this state are participating in, whether it's Medicaid CPC, Medicare C CPC Plus, ACOs or whatever, that there is a big emphasis on managing chronic conditions. And I think that there has been a significant decrease over the past five years in these measures that is not being reflected here. And I, I'm um, hoping that maybe we could look at a more objective standard, whether it's CDC reported data or some other um, set of criteria that would actually key into, as, you, as everyone has said, the achievable goal of improving those chronic conditions in the state of Ohio. So thank, thank you, you for Kat letting me comment. Yeah, thank you. So you're pointing out an important limitation of the BRFAS survey, which is that it's based on self-report. And so if we can get better data, if we can get you know bi biometric data on these indicators um, at the population level for the state, that would be fantastic. So if you're aware of where we can um, get that data reported out, um, please, please send me a link. You can put it in the question box or you can send me an email or we can follow up later. And talk more about that. Um, I see some more comments here um, in, the, in the comment box from Beth, a balance between the both. Why? Um, the realistic target allows for realism, but having an aspiration allows for creativity and a dream to go for. And Carrie says, I think with the long disease processes that heart disease and diabetes have, big change is very difficult to get in a short period of time. All right, and then uh, I think I already read those. Okay, and I don't think we have any more hands up right now, so I'm going to go to our next discussion question. So the next set of questions here is, what experiences do you have, um, have you had in setting targets in your organization or community? And have you had any experiences with setting targets that were too big or too ambitious or not ambitious enough? And what are some lessons learned to inform the ship? So I'm sure there are folks on the call who have been involved in maybe setting targets for a local um, CHIP or implementation strategy or maybe at a state agency or some other organization. So we would love to hear um, your experiences and, and how that might inform how we do this for the SHIP. <clears throat> okay, we have a hand raised. From Tiff Huber. Go ahead, Tiff. So uh, I think it's important that when we talk about setting these targets and, you know, and some of the things that we've done in the past is you kind of have to have something realistic, obviously, and achievable. But sometimes it's really good to have 
like a background as to what you're, you know, if you're setting this very small achievable goal, maybe saying in the background, like what the aspirational goal might also be. Um, we've had some, and some experience with that, like even just like locals and setting those goals on our grants and saying, okay, well, this is what we want you to do month to month or, you know, every year, this is where we want to go. But at the end of five years, this is where we want to be. So while we have our ship is for three years, we may say, you know, well, this is where we want to be in three years, but we're looking maybe, you know, looking beyond that may, that may be something that we, we also want to do to inform. Okay, great. And that sounds like for chronic disease, that might be particularly important. Okay. We have another, um, comment here. This is from Cheryl. I believe a balance between the two, since the Shaw ship is a continual process of assessment, planning, implementation of action, monitoring and evaluation, and back to assessment. So for 2022, a realistic target and having an ideal target. Okay, we have a hand raised um, from John. Go ahead, John. Hi, this is uh, John Belt with the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. You know, we, we certainly have a lot of experience with setting uh, targets and goals for lead poisoning prevention. But, uh, you know, the biggest issue we had was uh, developing a national and statewide lead poisoning elimination plan through 2010. And when that didn't happen for several years, uh, a lot of the advocates and other folks moved on from the issue of childhood lead poisoning and elevated lead levels, particularly at the national level, thinking that we had worked through it for the previous decade and had uh, reached our healthy people goal. So it's prob probably... I like to be ambitious, but it was a real eye-opener when uh, we didn't uh, reach any of our goals and uh, everybody moved on from the issue. So I think that's the biggest lesson that we learned. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. I, In the interest of time, I'm going to um, move us along to the next piece, but um, be assured that anything that you type into the question box, we are including that in our notes from these webinars. So if I don't get a chance to read off everything, um, we don't worry, we're, we're definitely um, considering and compiling everything that, that you guys are sharing with us. So now I wanna talk about priority populations. Um, so these are groups of Ohioans that have experienced worse outcomes than the overall population. And these are examples of priority populations that were included in the last ship. So we looked at race, ethnicity, gender, income, education, disability status, and geography, depending on the data source. So some of our data sources um, don't have su subgroup breakouts, um, but others do. And in a minute, Haley is gonna share the data that we do have for chronic disease um, and what priority populations we can look at there. But um, first we wanna get your input, um, thinking about <clears throat> priority populations in general. Um, so there are a few different ways that we can think about how to set targets for priority populations. And to illustrate these two ways of doing this, I'm going to use this apple tree metaphor that I'm sure some of you have seen for describing equality and equity. And in these pictures, the apples are representing optimal health outcomes, the ground represents the social, economic, and physical environment, and the apple crates our policies, programs, and other resources. In this first image, all three people have the same policies and programs, but two of them can't reach the optimal outcomes because of where they're starting from. In the second one, the apple crates are tailored and targeted so that everyone achieves optimal health outcomes, and this is what health equity looks like. Now we're going to use this picture to talk about the two ways to set targets for priority populations. In the first approach, uh, universal targets, we would set the same target for everyone. So the apple would be at the same level. So for example, um, we would set the target for the black infant mortality rate at the same rate as the overall infant mortality rate. 
This approach makes the case that we must eliminate disparities and inequities, so it's very consistent with the goal of achieving equity. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that to be effective, it needs to drive targeted allocation of resources, funding, and power. In other words, the targets are universal, but the strategies, those apple crates, need to be targeted and tailored with more resources directed towards groups who have the furthest to go to reach the apple. And then in the second approach, um, we would vary the targets for each population. So priority population targets would be set based on trends and baseline data, and therefore um, might be different from the overall targets. This approach is not consistent with the goal of achieving equity, but it is seen as being more realistic. So this kind of brings us back to that question of achievable versus realistic. And now we'd like to get your feedback on um, which of these two approaches you think we should take in the ship. So the universal um, approach, I'll go back to that slide. So in the universal target approach, we would have the same target for all groups. And then that would really put the focus um, and the, the conversation would then need to go to those apple crates. So talking about what do we need to do in terms of program services, policy change, resource allocation um, to get everyone to that optimal place. And then this is the population varied approach where we would have different targets for different groups um, based on what we're seeing in the data. So um, once again, we'd love to have you raise your hands. You can also use the question box, but we'd love to hear some more voices. Okay. Um, Chesre has her hand up. Go ahead, Chesre. Hi. Um I feel that we should definitely try to use the universal, um, although population varied is easier. Um, it definitely, even in the illustration, it looks um, unreal because the apples don't float in midair. So um, saying that we're going to, you know, do you know what I mean though? Yeah. So, <laughs> literally. So although focusing on those boxes is difficult, um, it just seems, it, it just, it just seems like a more fair approach and uh, it's going to require us to use more of our brains and be more innovative in our thinking, but it's definitely um, the right one because uh, health equity is, is very important. Okay. Thanks, Cesare. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a um, comment here from Beth. Um, universal goals and objectives. I believe this would help um, with organizations and individuals do personal work on bias and racism, workplaces on systemic issues such as hiring practices, policies, and funding, and what zip codes we are serving. All right, so really putting that focus on those apple crates and thinking about that in a very comprehensive way that includes organizational and systemic um, issues. Mandy says, I think universal is where we need to be. Those who are further away should receive more resources to create greater equity. So focusing on those apple crates. Okay, would anyone else like to add? Oh. We have um, a comment from Cheryl, universal. I believe this will help us focus on the equity issue. Okay, so I'm hearing from this work team um, a lot of energy around the universal targets. Um, I think the conversations on the other two calls today have been maybe a little more mixed. Okay, I'm gonna move us along to another discussion question here. What other suggestions do you have for addressing equity in the target setting process? And what other issues should be considered in setting priority population targets? So any additional thoughts, anything we didn't ask about that you think is important? And we'd love to hear some more voices. 
So don't be shy about raising those hands. Okay, I'm gonna move us along to um, Haley and Haley is going to um, dig into the data a little bit more for us so we can talk more specifically about targets and priority populations. Thanks, Amy. Okay, so move us along here. Um, so our objective in this next part of the meeting is to gather guidance from you all in order to finalize the overall targets, the priority populations, and the priority population targets for the chronic disease indicators. So as we've discussed before, there's um, no final decisions being made on the call today. We're just hoping to gather information from you all that will inform those final decisions as they're made in the next couple of weeks. So as a reminder, um, the desired outcomes selected for chronic disease are uh, to reduce heart disease, reduce diabetes, and reduce harmful childhood conditions. And that one includes both asthma morbidity and child lead poisoning. We landed on these outcomes uh, based on all of your feedback at our June 4th in-person meeting, um, also the results of the prioritization survey, and in con consultation with other subject matter experts. So here's how we're gonna move forward on the call today. We'll review some of the data related to these indicators um, for each desired outcome, and then we'll have a discussion about what factors to consider for target setting around each indicator. So let's move forward with the first one, which is to reduce heart disease. These are the three indicators within the heart disease outcome. So we see coronary heart disease, heart attack, and hypertension. Each of these come from the BRFIS, and they're each about the percent of adults diagnosed with these conditions. The prevalence um, for each of the heart disease metrics has increased slightly from 2015 to 2017, which is our two baseline data years here. On the online SHAW, we see that heart attack prevalence has increased from 2011 to 2017 from about 5% to 5.5%. We also see that heart disease and hypertension prevalence is higher in Ohio than in the US overall. So with that background, we'll head into our first discussion around the target setting. So what factors do you think are important to consider when setting targets for each of these indicators? So are there measurement issues we should know about with those BRFIS metrics, federal, state, and local policy changes, other trends happening around heart disease um, that are important for us to consider as we're thinking about how to set targets for these metrics? So go ahead and raise your hand, put the data back up so you can see that. Love to hear your feedback on this. Elizabeth, go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Great, thank you. It's Elizabeth. Um, and I'm wondering, I know heart disease is, is tremendously significant, we know. Is there another measurement when we're talking about looking at putting these metrics out there besides the BRFIS that we can consider? I know that we have um, hospital data from Ohio Hospital Association that may be helpful, or there may be some other stats. And I asked this because when we were looking at um, how to measure it, we it, this was a t tough one because we didn't know if we wanted to look at BRFIS, self-report, readmissions, uh, PQIs, and there didn't seem to be a really solid um, metric to use. So I'm wondering if there's some homework we can do to see what solid metrics are out there. Just an idea. Sure, sure, sure. So there are a couple other ones out there um, that we've considered and have looked at. Um, so one is, you know, we know the Ohio Hospital um, Association has some data related to this. Um, that data is not publicly available, so there would be a little bit of money that have to be spent to access that data, um, but that is an option. Vital Stats through ODH also has heart disease mortality data, um, which might be interesting to look at as well. So those are some others that we've considered. Kathy, we see your hand raised as well. Uh, I, I would second that to look at, um, I know that we had worked with OHA, our organization, 
to develop statewide statistics on um, patients with diabetes and hypertension who are um, discharged from any hospital in Ohio over a four or five year period. And I don't know what it would take to have OHA work with uh, HPIO to get that data for the ship. But, um, you know, I think especially when you're talking about heart disease, um, because of the fact that that is a condition that brings patients to the hospital, that that would be your best source of data. Um, I know other sources might be HEDIS reporting for the payers, which is frequently broken into subcategories like Medicare and Medicaid, um, or some of the other um, public health reporting. And so, I'm, I, again, I'm just supporting whoever spoke right ahead of me about trying to find better sources of data that are more representative because I think, again, that if you're trying to improve the statistics in the state, it's really important that you use statistics that people can then change their behavior around because they'll have a benchmark for their organization, their county, their state, whatever it is, and um, that's something maybe as a group we could all look at. I, I don't know, but I, I just think that's an important point. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's um, certainly interest in using clinical data or something other than self-reported data. Um, so if there are folks on the call who are able to directly connect us with that data, um, and in particular, we're looking for a population <clears throat> population level prevalence data that's publicly available. Um, and so we, we welcome input from all of the work team members on how to, how to find that data. Um, along that line, we have a comment here from Jonathan Lever. I support the use of OHA or EHR based um, for C, CAD, MI, and HTN. Um, so again, the OHA data is, um, there is a cost associated with that data. All right, thanks everyone for that discussion. Any other thoughts about target setting for these metrics, the heart disease metrics? Any factors out there in the environment that should be considered when setting targets for these metrics? If not, we can move forward to talk about priority populations. Okay. Hello. Hi, Carrie. <clears throat> Hi, I just wanted to say, um, especially around hypertension, some of the work that um, CDC funds um, the Ohio Department of Health to do <clears throat> is around um, finding those who have hypertension but don't know it, and so diagnosing those with hypertension who are what they call hiding in plain sight. And so the consequences of that work would be that hypertension prevalence would increase, at least in the short mm. term. Mm. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, Carrie. That's great. All right, let's move forward to, Alana, will you click the slides for me? Great, talking about the priority populations. So from this Burfist data that we're working with today, the prevalence for both coronary heart disease and heart attack are fairly low. And that means that it's really hard to break out this data into subgroups. The confidence intervals are pretty wide, um, which means it's just not a good way um, to measure those subgroups. So we don't have priority populations for either of those metrics. However, for hypertension, um, the prevalence is quite a bit higher, and so it can be broken out into these subgroups. These are the groups um, that we had as priority populations in the 2017 to 2019 ship. You'll notice that there are quite a few of them. Um, and you'll notice that um, for most of these, the, uh, the rates increased over that time period. So um, 
again, that there are a lot of these metrics. Something that we're focused on in this ship um, is that because we have flipped the ship and we're um, including indicators for the social determinants of health, health behaviors, and access to care, we have approximately doubled the number of indicators in the ship this go round, which means that we want to be mindful about how many priority populations we're elevating for each individual indicator, really so that priorities remain priorities and we're not including too many things um, to see really true movement on in the next few years. So what thoughts do you all have about the priority populations you see here? You'll see that older adults have the highest uh, rate of hypertension, low um, Ohioans with low educational attainment and low income have high some of the highest ones as well. What thoughts do we have about um, which of these priority populations should be elevated um, most highly? What priority population should remain in this next iteration of the ship? So can we see hands or comments on that? All right, Lark, we see your hand. Lark, go ahead, you're unmuted. All right, we're not hearing ya. Maybe make sure you're unmuted on your end as well. Um, okay, other other hands. Lark, you can feel free to type in the question box too and I'll I'll read out loud if you have thoughts on that. Other thoughts? on which priority populations for hypertension are most important to elevate. Marla notes that low income hopefully captures some other groups that that might be inclusive of some other folks. Lark says low income would address some of the other target areas more globally. Okay, so Two sort of thoughts there for low income being sort of a, a comprehensive measure. Beth has maybe some questions. So um, what's the gender breakdown on this? That's a good question. Um, and are we planning on working at the individual slash relationship level or are we going to work at the community level? Um, CDC is moving more towards community level work. So this gets to some of the strategies that we would use to address this. Um, and that conversation is pending that's going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks and really we're interested in working at all levels to address the priorities in the ship so i don't think it would be an either or maybe it would be a both and in that case thanks beth any other thoughts about priority populations we're going to get the opportunity to vote here in a second we want to take any other thoughts in the large group before we do that. Okay, let's move forward to our poll. So here we, um, we want to know which priority population you think should be selected um, for this indicator for hypertension, note that we were only able to give you five options on the poll and there are six potential priority populations, so we grouped low income and low educational attainment together on this poll. So just be aware of that. Um, if you feel strongly that one should be elevated and not the other, you can go ahead and type that in the question box and we'll note that. Um, but this is your opportunity to tell us which of these you think is the very most important to be elevated in the ship. We want to hear from everybody. We're pretty close. All right, I think we can go ahead and close out. Alana's going to show up for us. Okay, so most folks selected that low income, low educational attainment for a group, um, which is actually two, which I think is fine. Um, and then we also saw a decent number of votes for black, non Hispanic Ohioans with hypertension. So that's helpful feedback. Thank you. Okay, um, let's keep moving forward to diabetes. So 
For diabetes, we just have one indicator. This is the percent of adults who have been told by a health professional that they have diabetes. Again, this is a Burfus metric. Um, we can see that the U.S. rate, um, or no, the online shot tells us that the U.S. rate for diabetes is lower than the Ohio rate. It was 10.5% in 2017. This has stayed fairly consistent over the past couple years. So what do we think about this? What other factors um, out there in the environment should we consider as we're setting a target um, to reduce diabetes prevalence? This is a good time to think about, do we want to be um, achievable with this target or do we want to be a little bit aspirational? And what, what factors in the environment might um, inform our decision on that? So you can go ahead and raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Or you can type your question or your comment in the question box. Not seeing a whole lot of thoughts around diabetes. Amy says, perhaps look at pre-diabetes conditions. So that's a thought. Thank you, Amy. Okay, so this is another place where we might just wanna hop forward to the priority populations. You're gonna see a really similar list to the one we just saw. This is again, the list from the 2017 to 2019 ship. These are the priority populations we had in the last go round. Um, very similar list, pretty long list. So is this another place where we think that it's important to elevate low educational attainment and low income as our priority populations. Those are places where we see pretty high um, rates of diabetes. People with disability also have a fairly high rate, as well as our older adults. So which of these priority populations do you think are most important to elevate and why? Okay, so we have a comment from Cheryl. She's asking um, if the, there will be targets set separately for the healthy behaviors that impact chronic disease, which is an excellent question, and absolutely there will be. So in on the left hand of the SHIP framework, we have all of the factors that impact the outcomes that we're interested in. Chronic disease is one of those outcome priority areas where we're looking at things like heart disease and diabetes. In addition to that, in those factors, we have our healthy behaviors, and that includes tobacco use, um, healthy eating, physical activity, um, and so that's where we'll be setting targets for those sorts of um, indicators that would improve chronic disease down the road. So absolutely, that is something that is included in this version of the ship. Okay. Here he says, with racial disparity, you really see it significantly on diabetes mortality. So is there something happening after diagnosis that is disparate racially? That's a great question and maybe would be a reason to advocate for keeping black non-Hispanic as a priority population to maybe track that as well as diabetes mortality to see kind of where that breakdown might be happening. It looks like low income group has the largest increase. Yeah, that's a good note, Candy, that we see an, a decently large increase in diabetes prevalence among low income Ohioans. Liz says the last ship was focused on pre-diabetes, but the outcome was focused on diabetes prevalence. In addition to diabetes prevalence, we should also add in a pre-diabetes measure as well. I'm seeing a couple people talking about pre-diabetes, so that's definitely noted, we appreciate that. Okay, let's, let's, we have a poll on this one, don't we? Yeah, let's throw a poll question so you guys can tell us which of these proteo populations you think is most important to elevate. And you'll see again, low income and low educational attainment are grouped together for the sake of space.
Okay, so we'd love to see everybody vote. I'm seeing quite a few of you. Just get a couple more folks. And then Alana, go ahead, Alana, will show us the results of that. Okay, so again, about half of us think that low income, low educational attainment is important to elevate, and then almost all the rest of us say black, non-Hispanic Ohioans. So that tracks with the conversation we had and that makes a lot of sense. Thanks to everyone. Okay. So the last um, outcome that we'll look at is uh, to reduce harmful childhood conditions. And this includes two childhood conditions, asthma morbidity and child-led poisoning. The asthma morbidity indicator is around emergency department visits for pediatric asthma per 10,000 children under age 18. The child lead poisoning indicator is percent of children ages zero to five with elevated blood lead levels. You'll see that rate of child um, emergency department visits for pediatric asthma has decreased from 2012 to 2016. And for child lead poisoning, um, that stayed fairly consistent over the past five years. You can see in the online SHA, um, we also see in the online SHA that lead exposure risk is very high in almost all of Ohio's largest metro areas. So this is something that a lot of cities in Ohio are very concerned about. We know the rates of lead exposure are potentially very high. So for these two, what factors do we think are important to consider when setting targets? for these indicators. And it might be really different for child asthma and for lead poisoning. So love to hear your feedback on these two. So, so Hope noted that um, it's really difficult to pick one priority population um, and it's very, very possible that there will not be only one priority population um, we just want to know from each of you what you think the very most important is to prioritize, um, just so we can get a sense of what we absolutely need to make sure is in there. Um, it will likely be more than one. Amy says, wonder if we need an outcome for BLL tied to screening, blood lead levels. We did talk about including um, the, the percent of children who have been screened as an indicator, and that was actually discussed in the access to care group, and they decided not to prioritize that. But I think when we get to the strategy selection phase, we'll certainly be wanting to talk about screening. Um, and so I think, I think we could be addressing um, screening during that phase. All right, thanks. Chesre, we see your hand up. Go ahead, Chesre, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I did have a question. Income was one of those, uh, correct? It was grouped with uh, um, educational, educational attainment. Okay, yes. Okay, so um, my suggestion would be income because if you think about um, housing, um, usually the children that do experience the um, high asthma issues and the lead are usually ones that have, um, you know, live in deplorable housing conditions, which is based on income. So that's just my view. Okay, that's a, that's a really good point. And so we have not gotten to the um, priority populations for these measures yet. We'll see those oh. in just a second, but okay. that, that point is very well taken and <laughs> will, will come into play in the next slide. So you just got us a little bit jump started. That's fantastic. John, we see your hand is up. Uh, this is John. I, I was just going to chime in with the priority populations, but then I guess we're going to wait till the next let's, slide. Let's jump there. No, let's go ahead. Alana, can you? Okay, so I'll, I'll do the priority populations for both child asthma and for blood lead, um, and then we can talk about both of them at the same time. So 
Child asthma morbidity was elevated in the last ship. African Americans were the priority population at that time. Um, this is what it looks like. We see that the the rates um, of emergency department visits for pediatric asthma for African Americans have also decreased from 2012 to 2016, but they're just exceptionally high. Um, and Amy's writing me a note. Oh, there was a methodology change is what she's telling me in this metric. So it's really not even a true reduction. Oh, I'm seeing that in the note below. Isn't that fantastic? ICD-9 to ICD-10. So um, the rates are still much, much higher for um, black Ohio children than white Ohio children. And so that's something to note for child asthma morbidity and emergency department visits for those, those kiddos. Child lead poisoning, um, this is data collected by the Ohio Department of Health and the priority population that we're able to glean from that data is high risk zip codes. And so this is um, an ODH kind of grouping of counties or zip codes um, that was um, put together using predictive analytics. And the factors considered for identifying a high risk zip code include the housing environment, which gets to Shazray's point, socioeconomic and demographic factors of those zip codes, housing and population density, um, and of course the blood lead testing data. So that's what it means to be a high risk zip code, is a grouping of those factors. Um, and we can measure that as opposed to the overall for elevated blood lead in children. So those are the priority populations um, that we've identified for these metrics and we're happy to have a conversation about them now um, and really the question here is do we think these priority populations are important to elevate um, or should we just measure only the overall and not really have a priority population for these? So Shazray or John Welcome to jump back on the line. Tiff has raised her hand, so we'll go with her first. Hi, so I think, I mean, I think we're pretty much on track with having a priority population for asthma. The, the highest uh, burden in utilization is children, um, particularly zero to four, and then um, children under 17 after that. While there are some issues um, with adult populations, I think we'd be kind of aligned with CDC's initiatives for asthma um, and it kind of focuses on pretty much all the evidence-based strategies at this point. Okay, great. Perfect. Thanks, Tiff. John is back. His and name is so, okay. This is John, and you did a good job of outlining our high-risk zip codes. And, you know, by default, it, it, the zip codes do pick up the black population who are mm -hmm. disproportionately represented with uh, blood elevated blood lead levels and blood mm -hmm. exposure. So, you know, we've got a lot of data and a lot of analysis. So I, I think you did a really good job outlining it. So I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Okay. So any other thoughts about these priority populations, it sounds like we think they're both really important to highlight. Um, if anyone has other thoughts about that, feel free to drop them in the question box. Okay, all right. I think that we are gonna wrap up our meeting today. We're a little bit over. We appreciate you guys sticking with us. Um, Aragina is gonna give us a few final um, housekeeping closing comments. That's a perfect time if you have final burning thoughts to just throw them in the question box because we'll take those with us at the end of the call. Um, and we really appreciate you sticking through with us um, and providing your excellent feedback. Oh, hi. So um, I did not tell you guys about the overall health. So um, I just wanted to really briefly tell you that at previous meetings, um, the, chronic, the chronic disease group has also been tasked with discussing and providing recommendations on the indicators for overall health in the ship. And at the July 4th meeting, the group decided not to make any changes from the 2017 to 2019 ship. So these are the two indicators about overall health status and potential life lost. Um, 
we see those two priority populations up there. The group decided to keep this the same, um, and so we won't be having a conversation about that on the call today, but we just wanted to update you about that since several of you were in that um, June 4th meeting that, that this is the status of that. So thanks again for all your feedback, and I am now going to pass it to Arjuna. All right, thank you, Haley. So looking ahead, HPIL will send out a link to the final SMART objectives list with targets by August. So look out for that. And here are the dates and times for the next strategy se uh, selection meetings. Um, all of the next series of meetings are in-person at HPIO and uh, incorporate small group discussions. So in-person attendance is uh, required. Um, and as a reminder, there won't be a call-in option for these meetings. We encourage you to attend the meeting that best aligns with your skills, expertise, interest, and availability. The agenda for there we go. The agenda for the strategy selection meetings will be posted on the HPIO Shellship web page. Um, there's also resources here to help you determine which meetings you should attend. And if you would like to attend all three, we certainly welcome that level of engagement. Directions to HPIO and parking information will also be located here as well. Fun fact before we end today, and we, we thank you guys for staying with us. Some of you guys have been here for all three meetings. Um, today is National Give Something Away Day. So remember, you can always give away a smile and it's free. <laughs> we thank you for your time. We hope you guys have a great afternoon and look forward to engaging with all of you at the next strategy selection meetings. Thank you.